Hello, my name is Aliyah Bennett and I'm Carrie Bonner. And we were working with Dr. McCrander and looking at if CNNs exhibit differential gene expression during symbiosis with clownfish. And so for a little bit of background information, this association between clownfish and CNNs is one of the most famous examples of symbiosis found in the coral reef. And so we wanted to look at this relationship a little bit closely by looking at gene expression. And so down here in the bottom figure, you can see that this is when a clownfish starts associating with the sea anemone. And ultimately, we use the bubble tip anemone because it is a typical host sea anemone that is found in nature with its clownfish. And we decided to use the Clark eye clownfish because it's found in a wide variety of sea anemones, including many hosting anemones. And so we wanted to make sure that it would host with our anemones. As I stated before, these two organisms interact in a form of mutualistic symbiosis where they're basically benefiting one another. So for the clownfish, it provides the anemone with oxygen, nitrogen, and protection from predators. So as the clownfish inhabits the anemone, it will oftentimes swim through its tentacles, which will generate oxygen and prevent the anemone from bleaching. As it inhabits the anemone, it will also take in resources and then defecate on the anemone, which will provide it with a source of nitrogen. So current research has found that this nitrogen absorption directly from the clownfish only happens with clownfish association. So when they looked at it with shrimp, it was not seen to directly benefit the anemone and the anemone did not absorb nitrogen directly. So because of this unique association, this is another reason we wanted to look at if gene expression was shifting and so finally, the clownfish also provides the anemone with protection from its predators. So as a sea anemone predator comes up to it, the clownfish will oftentimes exit the anemone and kind of defend it, but also ward off the predators. On the other end of the spectrum, we have the sea anemone, which provides the clownfish with a home, but also food source. So as I stated before, if our anemone was a little bit bigger, our clownfish actually would have been inside of the anemone and they actually sleep inside their anemone. So while they're doing this, the anemone will pr protect it from its predator. So if a clownfish's predator comes up to the anemone, because they have venom in their tentacles, it will sting them and ultimately kill the predator, but not the clownfish. And this is because clownfish have a special mucus coating that prevents them from being stung by the anemones, but it benefits them because it wards off their predators. And finally, as the sea anemone digests and captures food, it won't digest it all the way. And so the clownfish will actually come up to the anemone and pick off its extra food scraps. And so due to these direct benefits and these unique association patterns that we see with clownfish and sea anemones, we decided to look at if there was gene expression associated with these benefits. So in other cnidarians, for example, corals, which are in the same class as sea anemones, we see that when they acquire their zooxanthellae, they shift their gene expression to acquire these symbionts. So we figured that if corals are able to do this, we wanted to see if sea anemones and clownfish are able to do this as well, because they have such a close interconnected relationship with one another. And so our main research problem was to see if sea anemones have any differential gene expression before versus after association. We wanted to see if that gene expression varies between 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. So in our experiment, we wanted to mimic the sea anemone's circadian rhythm. So our lights were set to turn on at 8 a.m. to mimic sunrise and then to turn off at 8 p.m. to mimic sunset. And then finally, if we did see genes that were being differentially expressed, we wanted to find out what those genes were, what they're doing, and how they're benefiting each organism in this association. Uh, our experiment is set up. We had eight tanks. Three of those tanks were a, a control group. We just had the bubble tips and enemies in them. The next three was a housing group, which had the bubble tips and the clownfish in them. The last two will hold extra clownfish in case one of those clownfish in the whole city didn't want to be associated with the bubble tip and enemy. We took samples before association from each bubble tip in the control and hosting. And we again took samples after association, which is about 12 hours after they associated. We then again took samples 48 hours after association, which was at 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. After the samples were taken, they were flash frozen into liquid nitrogen, and then the RNA was extracted. After the RNA was extracted, we found the concentration using the nanodrop machine and the, if, when the RNA concentration was higher than 20 microliters, 
we sent them out to be sequenced at a facility. And the facility used a next generation sequencing using an aluminum sequencer. Then they sent back the results by a fast Q file. Then, then the transcriptome was assembled by Trinity and the transcript assembly was then aligned and estimated abundance by Callisto. And a matrix was then formed using a gene map and the cluster values. Also, the cholesterol virus was then went through a differential gene express analysis by the R program, which generated a heat map. In that heat map, it showed 57 different genes, and those 57 genes were then was put to blast. When the blast result came back, we went and find the genes that were significantly different from each other and had similar functions we grouped them together with. But then we put those genes we picked in the graph using Excel, using a logarithmic scale. We took the average of each gene expression values. And for the error force, we use a standard deviation. We found 10 venom genes and use, we put the genes on the y-axis and the average expression values on the x-axis. We then, the orange is the hosting group and the blue is the control group. As, the, as you can see, there were seven out of 10 venom genes that was more upregulated by the hosting group than the control group. We also found 11 metabolism genes, with again with the genes on the y-axis and the average expression levels on the x-axis, and the hosting being orange and the control being blue. As you can see, some of those genes were only expressed for the hosting group, and one of them was expressed for the control group. The eight out of 10 metabolism was uploaded by the hosting enemy with the confidence and the control. Since we found significant results, we could compare them at 8 a.m. versus 8 p.m. with the 8 a.m. samples on the top of the graph and 8 p.m. samples on the bottom of the graph. And again, we put the genes on the y-axis and the average expression levels on the x-axis, with the hosting being orange and the control being blue. As you can see in the 8 a.m. samples, some genes were not expressed, but they were expressed at 8 p.m. It was more upregulated by the control group than the hosting. At the AM samples, the hosting group was more upregulated, and the control group was more upregulated by the at 8 p.m. And so, as my partner Carrie stated, if we go back over to our venom gene graph and we look at it, we saw that in the orange are are hosting anemones, and so they were upregulating venom genes. And so we think that this is because they were ultimately trying to protect their clownfish, but not harm it. So by upregulating these venom genes, they warded off any other predators, but they did not harm their symbiont directly. And so the reason they're doing this is because they're receiving so many benefits, as I stated before. And so why would they want to harm something that they're getting so many benefits from? And so this is the reason we think that they are upregulating venom genes. If we visit over to the metabolism gene graphs again, we see that once again, our orange, which is our hosting enemies, is much higher and being upregulated for metabolism. And this coincides with the idea that the clownfish is providing many nutrients, many extracellular products to the sea enemy. And so the sea enemy has to upregulate metabolism in order to kind of break down all of these and make use of them. And so if we look at the 8 a.m. and 8 p.m., we also see kind of the same deal. So 8 a.m., once again, our hosting have higher upregulation of metabolism genes than 8 p.m. And this kind of mimics the sea enemy's activity. So with their circadian rhythm, they were seen to be more active at night to avoid predators, which would explain why our control group is higher at 8 p.m. Now, clownfish, on the other hand, are active during the day. And so if they're active during the day, the sea anemones have to actively metabolize all of these extracellular products they're obtaining. And so that would make sense for them to be active during 8 a.m. and post association with clownfish. But if we think about it, sea anemones also have another symbiont known as the zooxanthellae. These zooxanthellae are photosynthetic organisms. So they must be active during the day as well in order to photosynthesize. 
So one of our theories is that what if the clownfish is ultimately giving its benefits to the zooxanthellae? If the zooxanthellae is receiving all of these benefits, it has to basically perform more and then it gives the sea anemones more benefits in return. And so if the sea anemone has all these products, once again, it has to digest them. And so metabolism genes would be upregulated. And so for our study, basically in conclusion, we found that metabolism and venom genes were being upregulated by our anemones with clownfish. We found that there was a difference between 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. depending on their symbiont activity. And then finally, one of the major take home messages from our presentation and our research project is that Ultimately, we think that the relationship between clownfish, zooxanthellae, and sea anemones is interconnected and much more complicated than science previously thought. We can't really determine from our research study if it was the clownfish benefiting the zooxanthellae or if it was the clownfish directly benefiting the sea anemone. And so we think this relationship might be more interconnected and more complicated than previously thought. So future research should evaluate gene expression within zooxanthellae in order to formally understand the symbiotic relationship that all three of these organisms participates in. We want to thank Dr. McCranda for being an advisor for experiment, Dr. Lingford for supplying the anemones, and for the Southern College for financial support in the experiment.